Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the dark works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Please join me as we read Psalm 25 responsibly by whole verse. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love, and according to the faithfulness of your covenant. Gracious and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in his way. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts and holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. 
As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life and that day catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place, and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Abide in me, Lord Christ, and I in you. Amen. Please be seated. In September, I began an inaugural nine-month Ignatian retreat, along with about 50 other Episcopalians from around the diocese, both lay and ordained, offered by the newly formed School of Spiritual Direction under the authority of our bishop. And the 50 retreatants and I committed to daily contemplative prayer prompted from scripture and followed with a prayer journal, a sort of a stream of conscious coming out of that contemplative prayer. Each day, individually, we do this, and we meet with our small groups twice a month to share this, share prayer in this way, and reflections and insights gleaned, gleaned. This Ignatian practice has been around for centuries, and for Ignatius, God can be found in all things and at every moment, even in the most ordinary, if we pay attention. One of the spiritual practices that we have encountered along this uh, journey since September is um, an exercise that Ignatius has um, called the examine. And it's a process by which one can pay attention and notice and reflect on one's day and discern how God may or be calling us in small ways and in big ways over time. It's something that we do daily. It's been adapted by in a couple different ways throughout the century, but it is all throughout the centuries of Ignatian retreat methods. But it is always a piece that is a part of his spiritual exercises. And as I prayed with our scriptures this morning, this Sunday, I found myself returning to the Ignatian spiritual exercise, the practice of the examine particularly as it relates to our short reading from Jeremiah, this little hope-filled reading uh, that ushers in our season of Advent when we are waiting and preparing for the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, on Christmas morn. And I began to ask myself, how would Jeremiah pray this examine? I've understood it in a five-step questions, and so that's what I applied as I prayed with this this week. And the first question is this. We're supposed to ask how God would view our day. And so I prayed with, if I were Jeremiah, trying my best to get myself into his story and into his context, how might Jeremiah pray that God would see his day? How would he imagine it? So here's Jeremiah, born of the tribe of Benjamin in the north. He's a descendant from Levitical priests, and he is called, as so many of us know, by the very familiar story at the beginning of Jeremiah in which God says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. A little bit later in that chapter, he tells Jeremiah, he instructs Jeremiah, gird up your loins, Stand up and tell the people everything. God made Jeremiah a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall against the whole land. As Jeremiah understood, he was, uh, he was against and prophesying to Judah's kings, Judah's princes, priests, and people. And throughout that, at the end of the first chapter, after God has fortified Jeremiah to go and take on this task, God says... I am with you. 
Well, it's a good thing that Jeremiah has been fortified because we hear the beginning, the first chapter, but 32 chapters later, until we get to our reading today, his life that we have a, a glimpse into in scriptures, his task is utterly brutal. His lifespan, the decades by multiple of multiple Israelite kings who rose to power and then were defeated and conquered and invaded, not by one other um, power, but two, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And while he began proclaiming God's exhortations up in the northern part of, of, of Israel, he was telling the Israelites there to return to the true root of their faith, The Israelites, in case you forgot, had uh, quite a time of resisting and letting go of previous patterns of worshiping other idols. Sound familiar? I think I still do that today. I can find myself having to, whoa, stop, stop. This is not what this is about. For the Israelites, it was the water in which they swam. They were making that transition from multiple gods and all the people around them. That's just what they did. And here they were being called to this one God. And they had a time of it. And Jeremiah is reminding them in all the ways that he can, one God, return to this one God. Meanwhile, he's saying and encouraging his people, invasions continue to happen. He saw exiles of his own people carted off north of the promised land, south of the promised land. But he didn't go with them until the very, very bitter end. He had made it to Jerusalem by that time, and he decided to stay there, we are told, as a way to acquiesce to the Babylonians in a hope, in a vain hope, I guess, of um, avoiding the soul destruction of Jerusalem. This effort ended with his exile into Egypt uh, when partisans killed the Babylonian-appointed Jewish governor. You can imagine how that went. And so there there went Jeremiah. We heard a little bit more uh, from him, and then he just sort of faded off into history. Simply put, after all of that chaos and to and fro and being ripped from land and sent hither, hither and thither, trying to keep your faith and wonder where it is, it was an utter time of chaos. A pure state of chaos was the sense I had in all of this in his readings and his writings, that it's really hard for me to even begin to imagine in this world. Day after day, week after week, year after year, Jeremiah just kept on going on. And so it's with that in the back of our minds that I came to the question of, if I'm Jeremiah, how might God see my days? And as I prayed into that space, I heard such an echo of God's encouragement to Jeremiah, saying, I see you. I see you following my instructions. I see you giving it your all, doing all you know to do, chapter after chapter, 32 chapters later. And I heard God marveling and appreciating Jeremiah's utter dedication to God's people and his unwavering hope in their ability to return and not lose sight of their Lord. Second question is you're invited to give thanks for the gifts of the day. And there was such clarity in my heart as I prayed with this uh, that Jeremiah would undoubtedly give thanks for the strength he found in God. And while I imagine Jeremiah would certainly offer thanks for the clarity of God's vision for him, he was, after all, made like a fortified city, I have to think also, as I prayed, what were his significant feelings after giving this thanks for God's presence and strength through him? Jeremiah surely had some feelings about that along the way in these many, many chapters. And that's our third invitation in the examine exercise. We're to pray with significant feelings that arose as we replay our day. So I couldn't help but wonder, despite the clarity of vision that he had, I have to wonder if some feelings along the lines of, I am getting nowhere with these people, 
Why don't they seem to get it? Our God is an all-encompassing God who desires all of our hearts, not just a piece. So put away your other gods. Put away your idols. I also have to think his feeling might have come up of how long can I keep doing this? Help. (laughs) Help. And then underneath that, the deep feeling of sadness. And we get a sense of that at the end of chapter 8 and 9, beginning of 9, where Jeremiah cries out, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. But finally, we get to the 33rd chapter we heard today. It's known as the little book of hope by some. And we hear Jeremiah declaring, surely the day, days are coming, says the Lord. Surely the days are coming, says the Lord. And he can realize it's not Jeremiah who has to get through all of these feelings and this woe and this I can't do it anymore. He can't do it anymore if he's doing it by himself. But in that fourth question of rejoicing, he also is invited to seek forgiveness and give back that understanding or that misunderstanding that he, Jeremiah, had to do it all. But really, it is the Lord's doing and that the days are surely coming. And then the fifth question or step. You look to tomorrow. Jeremiah's declaration of the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made. I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved. All will live in safety, and this is the name by which it shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That's what we just heard read this morning from that little book of hope. How deep down Jeremiah must have believed this with all his heart and his mind and his soul after everything that he lived through and the declared prophecies about what a joy it must have finally been to begin to look to tomorrow and the hope-filled promise that was coming with Yahweh that the Lord, it is the Lord who is our righteousness, not these kings who have led us astray as Jeremiah has been critiquing, but the Lord. And when we can turn there a radically new way, their political and religious institutions could work in the future with Yahweh at the center of their hearts. A new generation of the Davidic kings would spring up and promote justice and righteousness rather than exploitation, self-promotion, and violence, which had been the pattern with the kings and the institution during Jeremiah's lifetime and before. Beloved, it is from this very branch of David that the Christ child one day sprang up, vulnerable and powerless, and yet the ultimate teacher of the way towards justice and righteousness away from distractions and idols, exploitation, self-promotion, self-centeredness, and all the violence in all the little ways and big ways that come from those behaviors. And it is this same Christ child that we await, Emmanuel, God with us. It's the same one that we await to arrive on Christmas morn. And so I invite you during this season of Advent much like we have the practice during Lent to take on a practice or an exercise, to consider praying the examine once a day, even five minutes. I trust, given my own experience, that you will start to find uh, a different awareness uh, of, of your day and Christ in your day and in your midst. And another version that we work with is this idea of the examine of our hands. We open our hands And in one hand, we think about what has drawn us to God that day, 
And in the other, we think about what has distracted us from God. And we take a few moments just to replay that and journal that and offer that and let it direct our tomorrow. We are not Jeremiah. We are not really fortified cities and all that. We won't become perhaps like him. I don't think that's the point. But I think in these practices of the examine throughout Advent, what I do trust is that as we let go of things that distract us and are drawn toward the things in God that God is calling us to be, we will become more authentically ourselves. And those distractions and those idols will fall away. And we will become more and more in the likeness of this Christ child who we are preparing to welcome on Christmas morn. Amen. Please rise and join me as we reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from God. ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, those in prison, and the sick, especially Al, Alexander family, Anita, the baby family, Blake W, Bob, Caroline, Charlie, Damien, Ed, Felicita, Fred, Grossgroots family, the Hamlin family, Huber family, JD, Jean, Jerry, Jim C, Joe, John L., Jean, Catherine, Lucille, Mary R., the Matz family, Mrs. Stahl, Pat B., Richard, Rittenhouse family, Rosenbaum family, Sandra, Scott and Margot Roos, Sharon, Sharon H., Sherry, Stephanie B., Steve B., Tracy M., and the Williams family. Pray for those in need or trouble. 
I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Margaret Brown, Pat Brown's daughter-in-law, and Dr. Jean Head, the eye doctor next door. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those who serve in the military. I ask your thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life and all those who are celebrating birthdays, especially Richard Ward and June Harris. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Kneeling, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. The glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Godspeed. You're ribbonless. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everyone on this first Advent, Sunday in Advent. Please be seated. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, a couple of announcements. I would uh, highlight the, the back. Um, the Bible study, actually, we had a little bit of a change of pace because we can think on our feet and make decisions and changes if we want to. I think we are picking up next Sunday, uh, read through the Gospel of Matthew during the season of Advent. So um, you're welcome. It starts at 9 in um, the Fireside Room. And if you're interested in that, just let the office know, and we will let you know what readings you need to make happen for that. So um, I'm excited to share that with you all. Uh, and then additionally, some of you may have seen this in the mail. I made some copies of it. They're in the back. But our bishop's appeal came out at the end of the year. Uh, he typically, uh, Jaime's got some, thanks Jaime, uh, has a, an appeal. And last year, uh, we raised an incredible amount of money for the historic AME um, uh, church in North Tulsa. That was the only church um, that was still standing after the Tulsa uh, race massacre, and they celebrated that 100-year anniversary. Celebrated is not the right word. They marked it uh, in May, and we raised a tremendous amount of money as a diocese for that, um, which still amazes me. So if you might have seen uh, in your uh, mailbox, this is a flyer. It is uh, the Bishop's Appeal this year in support of um, uh, what's called a Magdalene um, house, and you can get a little bit more in the back if you want, but uh, basically it is creating a home for women uh, survivors uh, who are coming out of incarceration and transforming trauma into healing and wholeness and love. There's lots of statistics on this. What I didn't realize that's highlighted in the letter is that 5% of the world's population of women are incarcerated, 30% uh, of those, however, are in the U.S., 
and Oklahoma has the highest incarceration rate for women. And this we've noticed and is uh, they're modeling this after uh, a successful, it's a wraparound services. So it's a two year house where, where women are coming out of incarceration are um, housed, they work together, they receive therapy, spiritual support, training, and two years later, they finish the program, about 75% finish. And at five years, they have a 75% uh, recidivism rate. So um, that's amazing. Uh, they say 75% of graduates remain sober, employed, and in, in independent housing five years later. Um, so I commend you to think about this, pray about this. There's more information, but I do want to give a, a plug for that. Um, there's 60 of these open around the U.S. They are expanding. The first one is looking to be in Oklahoma City through the Episcopal Diocese. So um, I think it's pretty powerful. So if you have questions, let me know. And then finally, it's wonderful to receive communion with you all today. We have wine that's back. <laughs> So we may have forgotten a little bit about how to do this, but we do have one person who is going to be serving uh, the chalice. And um, so uh, th they'll be here with me and the bread. And then we'll just make your way forward one by one. You can receive the bread only or you can receive the bread and the wine. OK, we'll, we'll remember. It's been a little while, uh, but it's wonderful to share in communion with you all. Uh, so let's do that. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due God's name. Bring offerings and come into God's courts. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. 
You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your way. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Please stand, sit, or kneel as is meaningful for you. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son. Jesus, the holy child of God, living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners. He healed the sick and proclaimed the good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at the table with his friends. They took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and again he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now, gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of your Christ, Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. And in the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Continuing, let us pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved, life is short, and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be quick to love and make haste to be kind, and go with the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.